you will there's a, are uh, invited in this walk lesson cafe which is a, a place of sharing just like Vespas is a place where uh, all is about uh, the sharing of practices and uh, ideas um, and you um, will hear from some um, artists tonight how uh, via remote uh, projects and walking um, we connect uh, around the world. Um, we have an, an, a beautiful menu, a beautiful variety of, uh, uh, the, of practices, ideas and uh, approaches um, that will be in the mix tonight. And uh, we uh, begin by letting uh, the artists present uh, their, uh, their work and then to have an, a conversation about uh, these uh, uh, approaches. Uh, and, and first, you know, you, you, you mentioned uh, Prespa and, and the, the continuation of this community. And, and uh, Deirdre and I both want to give a big thanks to you and, and Giannis, of course, as the organizers of this, uh, this, this gathering, this conference, this, this network of individuals and, and, and you know it's an honor to be invited and to share with everyone and it's so great to see people that I, I know from, from two years ago hey <laughs> and uh, you know uh, to, to, to make new connections and hopefully see them in Prespa in two years from now um, but with that uh, I'm Chris Kesmarek. Uh, I'm an artist, educator, animal lover. Uh, I'm located in New York City and uh, this is my remote collaborator Deirdre Hello there, I'm Deirdre McLeod. I'm an artist and an educator too. I do like animals, but not quite as much as Chris, and I'm based in Edinburgh um, by the sea in Portobello. <laughs> um, yeah, and both of us, we, we make site responsive work that's grounded in our, our immediate environments. So uh, and through a chance meeting on Zoom during an online summer school, which was actually also organized by Gert, <laughs> um, we, we, it enabled us to get to know each other's practice a little bit, to find common ground, and, and lay this foundational relationship for future collaborations. Uh, and then in 2020, as the world pivoted to COVID, uh, we, we discussed this new reality and how we might explore the themes that we're both interested in, themes of, of gesture, sight, and space. Uh, and uh, uh, But we would know that we would need to do this together at a distance. And so over the past years, we over the past year, not years, just one year, it seems like the past year was years, but uh, yeah, it was just one, believe it or not. Uh, we've been thinking about the ways in which abstract gestures, uh, human, uh, non-human, and, and even those of inanimate ob objects, uh, abstract gestures that can be found in any place can be located and specific to the place in which they're found. So that interesting relationship between uh, sort of a commonality and a specificity. Uh, and we've been wondering about whether these gestures might be used in a way of exploring qualities and characteristics of the places that we live in. And, and furthermore, we've been thinking about whether sharing gestures between places that are in some ways similar, uh, but also in other ways very different, might highlight these qualities more acutely. So we've been experimenting with capturing gestures from each of our locales and finding ways of sending them to the other to reproduce in their local area. Uh, so we thought about various ways in which this sending might occur, such as videoing and then sort of recreating the video and everything. Uh, but the method we decided upon is one that we've, we've sent to project participants for the project that we're doing here for the, the, the WAC conference. And uh, it, it, basically, we, we capture a gesture, an observed gesture in our local area, whether it's human, non-human, or even non-animate. Uh, and then we translate that gesture, that observed gesture, into a brief written or verbal text. Uh, and then the person who receives that prompt or that written text uh, interprets that text through reproducing or performing the gesture in their space. So there's that observation, that transmission, and then that translation and recreation. Um, the texts that we've worked with so far have been more or less poetic, uh, depending on the gesture and the sender, almost like a form of textual telegraph. Uh, and we feel that this method of observing, translating, and re-performing site-specific gesture enables us to explore themes of connection uh, and separation and place in a, in a very sort of playful and whimsical way. It's been quite fun. Uh, 
Um, to help make sense of all of that, <laughs> I'm going to share a short clip with you of some gestures that we've captured, translated, and performed in our home spaces over the last year. There'll be three sections, each one of a certain pair of videos. The first video would be the observed gesture that I've captured in my space here down in New York City, uh, and then the text that we've transmitted to Deirdre, and then Deirdre performing that within her space over in Scotland. So So that's a few examples of this exchange structure that we've established. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Deirdre to carry on from here with some reflections on, on the results of this sort of research. OK, so th thanks, Chris. Well, so hopefully from that clip, um, you can see that we um, both live at the edge of cities and near the sea in areas that are quite mixed, so there's a mix of of semi-industrial spaces and coastline and spaces that are used by people for lots of different purposes, biking and walking and, and running and relaxing. And the spaces aren't identical in any way, um, even though there are these kind of similarities. But what we were trying to do was kind of find points of connection within those spaces um, through that translation and transmission of, of a gesture that would allow us to kind of I suppose, explore space in, in, and, and place in some way. And so I suppose an example of one of those points of connection uh, might be the Arch of Steel prompt, which you saw at the end there. Um, the prompt was Chris's prompt. He came up with that prompt in New York um, and he took a, a video of the magnificent architecture of the, the George Washington Bridge and then um, sent to me in Portobello. Um, and I had no knowledge of where Chris had, had taken that, that video. Um, I simply got the, the text and nothing else. And um, using, I suppose, my imagination and looking around me within Portobello, I had to find an arch of steel. And um, the place that I could find was um, simply a, a metal bench on the promenade in Portobello, um, which is, is like a boardwalk. Um, so really, this, this project um, depends not upon familiarity, but up, up, about the unfamiliarity that comes from um, the, the distance and the remoteness that we have from each other. Um, I think if we, we worked out, if we knew um, anything about the spaces in which the other person was working in, that it might have limited our, our creativity and our um, possibilities for interpreting our, our instructions. So the remoteness was something that we were really depending upon and, and using within this project. And as we made these, um, these prompts and we translated them, we became aware of conventions that, that govern the use of space and that maybe operate differently within space in, in different localities and in different countries as well. 
Um, one of the early prompts that we didn't show you there, it was a very simple one that I um, observed and came up with, was to walk on a wall. There is a, a wall by um, the promenades that separates the beach from the pavement, and people often walk upon it. Um, so I sent that off to Chris to see what he would make of that. And it became clear to us that you know there are societal conventions that, that really determine how you walk upon a wall. Um, perhaps you're quite confident um, or um, quite self-conscious because it's not something you're expected to do. It might be surreptitious because you're really not expected to be there. And even if it is allowed, it might not be something that adults would choose to do, um, perhaps less so in some places than others. So we, we did begin to kind of get a sense of what it was possible to do in one set of spaces as opposed to the other um, it, it, um, as we compared our, our gestures. I think we began to feel that this methodology allowed us to know more about the spaces in which we live and work. And we became aware of things like scale, for example, looking at Chris's Arch of Steel, which was a huge bridge compared to the Arches of Steel that I could find in my place. Um, sometimes the, the gestures were about um, um, finding yourself, finding a small space. Um, and the, the spaces that Chris could find were certainly much bigger in scale than the, the spaces that I would find in a Scottish seaside town that, that's really quite quite old. And the kind of scale of the buildings and the, the landscape architecture here, I think, is, is much smaller. Um, one of the, the things that I think was unexpected was that we began to become kind of intimate with the places in which we didn't live. Um, so simply by observing the, the, the way in which Chris was performing some of the gestures that I gave him, one of which was, I think, to squeeze through a small space, um, I began to get a, get a sense of the spaces and felt I began to know them quite well. Um, the small space that I had in mind was a, a lane um, which led to the beach, but Chris interpreted this as being um, a bench. So he actually squeezed himself under the, the seat of the bench, underneath the table, and out the other side of the bench. Um, and through that kind of sense of moving through an unexpected space and through kind of touch, um, through awkwardness um, and through slow movement, I began to feel that if I ever came across that bench um, in the park in New York where he had been working, I would know it. Um, I, would, I would almost recognise it. Um, and so I think Chris would agree that from we, when we've discussed this, that he had a kind of similar sense of feeling that he had begun to know places in Portobello um, from that kind of similar um, sense of touch and, and pace and awkwardness. So those are just some of the reflections that we, we kind of gathered from this project and that made us kind of want to, to kind of work again and to present it in Prespa. So Chris, I'll let you conclude and um, say a little bit more about we have, what we have planned for this, this, this conference. Yeah, yeah. So, so these exchanges, it, it did actually, even when we were working on that project, start with ideas of, of walking. Uh, it ended up being kind of located in these seaside areas uh, that we would both have to walk to, uh, and we and we made that exchange um, sort of fixed to that seaside area. But for for this conference and, and and in continuation of the theme of walking with a question, which was something we were literally doing even before walking with a question was the name of this conference. <laughs> uh, we, we've we've use the context of the walk uh, of, of this, these questions of place and exchange and we've applied this this structure to the the project that we're doing that some of you have signed up for thank you so much for signing up uh, those of you that may not have signed up for it it's still available uh, you just email me uh, we're looking to have part one done by the end of day tomorrow so uh, there's still time to participate but the, what we're doing telegraph prespa uh, it, it has an added focus of the connection uh, to, to PRESPA. We're, we're working with this exchange, uh, but we're trying to create nodes of exchange, clusters of people with at least one uh, who's in PRESPA. So as we exchange the prompts and we enact them uh, in places other than where the prompts were, were, were generated from, uh, we're creating this woven structure of individuals who are connecting uh, with all of these different spaces, one of which is uh, PRESPA. So that's that's our Telegraph PRESPA project, this remote interaction with the centralized location of PRESPA being present for all of our remote interactions, hopefully for this project. And uh, we hope you'll you'll join in <laughs> and I, I look forward to hearing to what everybody else is doing with this this question and this 
this prompt and remote walking and thank you very much. <laughs> the, what strikes me in your project, uh, Deirdre and, and, and Chris, is the fact that actually you never met each other and then uh, like in one year, uh, you built um, more than, than just a dialogue. Uh, uh, the, it, 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 it's bringing together the intimacy uh, of your um, um, of your uh, living environment and uh, of yourselves as artists uh, together with, an, with, with a more global uh, intimacy. So the, the intimacy is, is, is very uh, very prominent prominent in this uh, form, and I sort of. Uh, um, the, the love the fact that you used the telegraph, which was maybe before the smoke signals, at least. Mm. <laughs> it was the, the first form of like communicating on, on distance. Uh, and uh, but uh, us bringing back these these old um, um, uh, traditions of, of communication uh, into a new um, approach of um, finding each other and uh, to become intimate with people you don't know. Um, uh, anyway, from your prompt going to another prompt, um, I would like to um, ask uh, Jess uh, if he can tell something about the uh, uh, proposal he had for our conference. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, thanks for all your hard work putting this together. Um, I should also start by saying that uh, the publication that I've that has been put together for this over borders too uh, was curated by myself and my daughter the artist phoebe riley law she's currently um, off on a small holiday in an area with very poor internet connection so i'm representing her here so um yeah th this uh, this um series of publications called over borders began with a, a commission from the walking festival of sound in Stockholm and uh, they invited me and Phoebe to create some scores but we wanted to open it out to other people um, so we did a, a call out to some of people we know who work with scores and to some artists that we know work like ourselves with located sound which is our, my primary uh, working method is uh, field recording and located sound and composition and we gathered together a collection of uh, artists who had worked extensively with scores, graphic scores, text scores, uh, photographic scores, and some who were very new to the form, had never worked with it before. And we've continued that with this second collection. Um, as you can see there from the names, there are some people who are very well known for working with scores, like Viv Corringham, um, Cheryl Leonard, um, and some who are fairly new to it, um, people like Vivian Wang, uh, some of you may know through her music, she, she performs in Jenny Val's band, for example, but also her own music. Listy Mangan, who's a very well-known uh, composer of Located Sound. Eliza Bozek. Uh, and I'll show you a few of the, the pages from the publication. It's available as a free PDF download, as indeed is Volume 1. And we didn't place any restrictions on artists, but we asked that they the scores they presented to us asked questions of walking and of primarily our objectification of other species uh, and this this thing we call nature, which is an in, entirely invented thing that um, involves a lot of uh, problematic biases and, and uh, assumptions. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a word, it's an act of separation, of course. It's a, a them and us word. Um, so each uh, composer and artist submitted a score that question, asked questions in certain ways, very broad uh, range of work, some with instruction, some very abstract just with an image or a few lines of text. Um, this is one by my daughter, Phoebe, which is an image of a, an, an old disused cattle run in Newcastle, where she lives currently. Um, so this was a... Was a uh, a run that allowed the herders to uh, feed cows through through um, a, a thin, narrow, uh, almost like a, to a, a topless tunnel, if you like. And uh, she's paired that with a a piece of uh, a text piece, a found text piece. Uh, these two scores um, 
the one with a lot of uh, text laid out as a, as, a, as a poem by Catherine Clover, and it's uh, referencing a species of bird. Um, quite a lot of Catherine's work uh, features bird uh, communication in some way, playing around with it as a as a form. And on the opposite side is Vivian Wang's uh, score, Night Walk on the Viaduct. Uh, these next two are uh, Felicity Mangan, score for Flip Flops for Nature Trails, <laughs> uh, which she created quite recently at a uh, residency. Uh, I mean, it's been a long time since I've worn flip flops. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd stay on my feet if I tried to walk with <laughs> them now. But if you if you can wear flip flops, have a go. <laughs> That's what I say. Um, and on the other side is Eliza Burzek's um, score. Uh, this is um, volume one of uh, of Over Borders, as you can see there. If you read down the list of artists, there are, there are different artists featured in that one including uh, Carol Finer, who some of you may know Carol. Carol was a member of the Scratch Band uh, with Canelius Cardew and um, an intrepid adventurer. She unfortunately passed away from COVID uh, in 2020. Uh, she came on many of the workshops that, that I run and um, she was one of those people who always asked questions of everything and also did a lot of tech scores in the 60s and 70s, so some of those are included. Uh, as well as people like Manfred Verda, who's well known for his tech scores. Yeah, so we didn't place any restrictions on the artists. We just asked them to submit because um, we wanted to encourage a very wide range of of uh, ideas around the, the process of scoring um, and make it available to everybody as a free PDF. We're hoping people will do them um, somehow, whether downloaded onto their phones or or uh, uh, tablets, or even print them off, you know. And there is a plan for another Borders book at some point, but uh, that'll have to wait until <laughs> until things are a bit more stable, shall we say. Uh, yeah, so that's it. I'm happy to answer questions later when we come to the, to the conversation. I don't want to plug up the rest of the talk too much, so I'll leave that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Uh, how sound uh, resonance goes uh, beyond the space and as well includes uh, people. Um, um, can we um, just so feel free to uh, use the chat to uh, leave behind your feedback, your comments, uh, and your questions? Uh, the, and, uh, and next um, practice of shared uh, walking is by the uh, Wool Brothers uh, group in San Francisco. Um, it would be uh, great to hear something more about uh, how you walk together. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's really, really nice to be here with you all. It's 11 o'clock here in the morning where we are, and big thanks to you, Gert and Janus, and others for inviting the Wool Gathers Collective to participate in remote walking. My name is Suzanne Cockrell, and my collaborators, Angela, Rebecca, and Deborah, and I are zooming in from the San Francisco Bay Area, unceded territory of the Chechenyu and the Ramatoshaloni peoples. I remote walk, wool gathering, walking the water's edge took place on July 4th, and it was a synchronized across time zones. So 8 a.m. in San Francisco, 6 p.m. in Prespa, we had walkers in Turkey, Brussels, England, and Praspa joining us to see what experiences of alignment and entanglement might emerge with each of us walking along the edge of land and water across the globe in time. The four of us met as professors at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, which is where we knew Lydia Matthews from, who gave us the, the heads up to uh, apply to participate this year. And we started meeting regularly during lockdown last year to commune and digest the shifting social dynamics and ruptures of the pandemic and build support uh, with and for each other as we all shifted to remote online teaching mid-semester. And this year, we formed the Wool Gathers Collective as an experiential research matrix. So walking as a question was a perfect forum for us to begin to explore our interest in liminal and threshold zones 
performance and social dreaming as a movement process and aesthetic methodology. Some of the questions that we're beginning to outline um, together uh, include how is a dream more than individual psychic data? Do dreams speak to each other? What's possible in sharing dreams, daydreaming in a social space? Is the dream a social form to bring new knowledge to light? And how is walking a somatic immersive dreaming process? I'm a professor um, in undergraduate and graduate fine arts at CCA teaching um, mostly in the area of social practice. Uh, my own artwork is interdisciplinary researching collaboration and documentary forms and uh, the ecology of place. And as a maker, I move and think primarily in terms of choreography. So I want to, uh, we're all gonna sort of share something of our process together. I'm gonna pass to Angela. Thank you, Suzanne. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Angela Hennessy, and I also teach at California College of the Arts um, with my amazing colleagues here. Um, and I primarily teach classes on death and art and, you know, working with young <clears throat> college students, young artists who are using their practices to respond to grief and loss. And so it's been a very busy time <laughs> um, in the context of the pandemic, in the context of COVID and the racial reckoning that we're all sort of becoming um, either are aware of or becoming more aware of. Um, so I want to start with the definition of wool gathering, which is a term that um, a few of us came to from different directions and um, kind of came, found this definition in the Oxford English Dictionary that I want to read. Um, wool gathering, indulging in wandering fantasies and purposeless thinking, from the literal meaning, gathering fragments of wool torn from sheep by bushes. Um, an activity that necess necessitates much wandering to little purpose. And this is a term from the 1550s. And so we wanted to actually kind of reinvent that. And you know, you can hear in the definition it's embedded with hierarchies of value and labor, notions of productivity. And so we came up with our own um, def sort of working definition. A social practice of wandering by a group of people separately at the same time as if in a dreamlike state a gathering of daydreams in the body-mind, a sharing of space and time from disparate locations, orientations, and bodies for the purpose of gathering dreams, a collection of movements, gestures, and sensory information across geographies and temporal experiences for the purpose of gathering dreaming bodies, a social practice of attuning dreams and somatic gestures. And just I want to introduce this idea of the body-mind as a way of undoing the mind-body hierarchy and kind of upsetting that dualistic relationship. So it's something that we're thinking of that kind of brings together this way of um, integrating our bodies, our moving, um, you know, walking practice with the thinking, sort of feeling, emotional practices. Um, and so a walking meditation is really an attunement and entanglement practice, as we are coming to call it. It's about recognizing the attunements and entanglements of our bodies to the land and to each other scattered across continents. And so for this conference for walking as a question, we invited participants wherever they you know, might be located to walk with us synchronized across time zones um, with a very simple um, prompt, walk alone and together walk along an edge of water, walk for one hour, walk with a form of collecting your experience, either through writing, recording, photographing, taking snapshots on your phone. Uh, so I'm going to pass it to Deborah, who's gonna share a little more about that. Um, I'm gonna just take the last few minutes we have and show you some of the images that we collected, um, the participants and the collective on the fourth and where we started to really look at some of the synergies but also some of the sort of disparate elements that came out of this collection we, we met with the group after we walked and it was a really intimate wonderful conversation there were a lot of things that came up between people even though we would never met each other and I want to underscore that feeling of intimacy that it was kind of an immediate thing because we were all very conscious of one another walking 
across the world, even though we were um, in different, really different places, we were in the same time um, category. So the prompt was very simple, as Angela said. Um, we we uh, asked people to walk along the edge of water, but we defined edge very, very openly, and we defined what the edge of water is very openly. So there were people walking on the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, along the lake in Greece. And also we had um, someone in Brussels who was um, doing research on waterways under cities and along the um, sidewalks and roadsides. So she walked along pathways. It was really interesting to see how people define that very differently. So here, here are some images from Brussels. Um, one of the things that we, we started to really notice was that there's a constant negotiation along the edge of anything. And conceptually, it's a very porous space, a liminal space. It's never a hard edge. I mean, think of the sea and the land and how they negotiate where that where that line is between the two. So we saw that coming up um, in people's experience. Um, the edge between human-made surfaces and organic surfaces. Here we see walkways covering water. The edge of organic plants that grow very naturally and then plants that are human um, planted in rows. And then also the negotiation between those, what we might call artificial constructions, human constructions, and then the, how nature is constantly pushing against those boundaries that humans are setting up between nature and what we consider ourselves to be not a part of the natural world, as one of the um, participants mentioned a few minutes ago. So there's that constant negotiation, that constant push and pull between humans' sense of control of nature and then the organic sort of reclamation of space. And that those that that edge again is very porous, where one starts and the other ends is um, a, a constantly moving thing. And that there's a definition, there's something liminal between those two a third thing, a third reality. These were some tiles that were found uh, in Greece that had been eroded by water. So there's even this, we were even beginning to see the sense that um, the man-made, the human-made um, will eventually be reclaimed by natural forces. There's also the edge between elements. There were beautiful collections that were made. The edge between uh, land and growth, the edge between water and algae, another kind of growth. The edge between ground and water or ground and wind. And then we began to see circles emerging and we began to think about circles also as liminal spaces, as portals perhaps. Um, this is a surveyor's marker that locates humans, again, in the organic landscape. Um, but here we have the land coming up out of the cement and reclaiming slowly. But those, those circles began to look like mirrors, reflecting the sky, bringing the sky down to the land, again, creating this kind of emergent um, porous um, space between elements, between natural elements. That's a reflection on shell. This is a reflection on bubbles. These are all images that were taken on the fourth. Um, we also had a circle in the form of an opening. And that really brought out the notion of the, the kind of liminal space, a portal between rock, earth, inside earth, inside land, towards water, towards air, and how those are, those are kind of magical spaces of transformation. And in England, the participant uh, found what she called a hangstone, and uh, I don't believe any of the rest of us knew what that was, but it is a stone with a uh, naturally occurring, typically by water force, on uh, a pole through the middle, and she considered that to be a very auspicious moment. 
So this was another kind of a circle, another kind of a portal into that magical space, the wool gathering space between night and day, between land and water, between daydream and night dream. So we were really excited to see those kinds of um, concepts emerging from all the people who participated all across the various continents where they were located. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, good evening from here in UK, um, a UNESCO World Heritage um, City. I'm delighted to be sitting here um, sharing this time in this moment with you. I would be even more delighted if I were in Presper, uh, <laughs> sitting there with Gert and Yanis having a good drink and uh, going on some wonderful calls. Um, but I think we all feel very much the same, very much the same way. Um, the Wall Gatherers Collective, what a beautiful name for a collection of artists. I love the sound of it. And uh, it's a lovely resonance for me. It's been a, I was in a slight dreamscape there when you were talking because I've just come off of lecturing on um, liquid scapes and fluid landscapes um, for uh, a course that I teach online for um, University of Oxford. So I am an archaeologist. Um, I would say more widely across history thinker and being in the world. Um, I'm at the University of Notre Dame and I lecture for University of Oxford in um, both in archaeology and sustainability studies amongst other things. I also curate and, um, and draw and perform and draw. Uh, I see the two as, as the same and the one thing there. So the project that I uh, have put together, bearing in mind we're sort of hybrid online and in real time, was came out of an interest um, with regards to the materiality of our walking. Um, we do a lot of talking and walking around ideas of the body and that's me included I specialize in the philosophy of phenomenology that very essence of the sensory perception of being in the world um, so very attuned to that corporeality of our walking and very engaged in a variety of ways academically and artistically with it but I saw this conference and this idea of walking as a question to really uh, think about this idea of materiality and and what's so wonderful about the project here the conference here is that it's an invitation for all of you to get involved in the way that you would like to get involved with um, as well how can we um, engage with the places the spaces the perambulations of our um, being and dwelling and moving around the world in this construct that we call the walk. Yeah. What is the walk? And where does the walk take us? Or indeed, where do we want the walk to take us? What are our thoughts and our consciousness as we are on these perambulations that we call the walk? So, in a sense, it's walking as many questions as well as walking as a question in that context. The lens through which there's many options for me to have explored this with you, um, uh, but the lens through which I chose, um, because it felt quite easy and applicable for all of us and also very fruitful, is this idea of the concept of the Wunderkarma. Uh, the Wunderkarma, the cabinet of curiosities in its widest sense, and an invitation for participants to walk, take many walks, um, however, in whatever way you want to, there is no prescription for that, but to start to collect things on your walk that you then in in a way that feels meaningful to you, um, put together this assemblage into this idea of the Wunderkarma in its physical sense. And my interest in you doing that and in myself doing that 
is at the very idea of curiosity. How can we then look at the wunderkammer of your walks and open up a discussion around the very nature of curious walking, that material manifestation of our perambulations. Um, so I walk, we all walk, that's part of why we are all here. And as I've mentioned before, my, um, my engagement is deeply phenomenological. I, I lean towards French existential phenomenology, particularly the work of Sartre, uh, Merleau-Ponty um, and Gaston Bachelard. Uh, this idea of our existence in the landscape, our sense of being and dwelling in the landscape through our corporeality, through our sensory um, selves. And uh, personally, I am interested in the deeply ephemeral to the point where there is almost non-existence. And that's where my drawing practice comes in, um, in particular. Um, and... I take my lead for this project from Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception. This idea of the body as a thing among things, it's caught in the fabric of the world. It's that fabric of the world I would really like to explore with you through this concept of the Wunderkammer. At its broadest sense, here is Mark um, Dion's Wunderkammer of collection of artefacts from the Thames foreshore uh, in um, Tate Modern Collection in London, um, uh, a factual wunderkammer and in many respects uh, a complete illusion. And we have a history of great wunderkammers such as houses that are wunderkammers um, and uh, historic collections that become wunderkammers. There are many options for this, and I really do use the concept of Wunderkammer in its, in its widest and broadest sense here. Um, we could take Joseph Boyce's work and look at the, the vitrine, the Wunderkammer vitrine, and here it's, this is about a collection, but, but in, in many respects it's about the, the, the context, the cabinet, the vitrine in which the collection is, is placed here, so it's as much about that. So maybe your Wunderkammer is um, about that. Um, I'm very to you, uh, Nicholas Lang's work, uh, this one in particular on culture heap and prehistoric stone implements uh, on his walks in South Australia that he has categorised into these um, formats here. This is a collective Wunderkammer and each one itself is um, a Wunderkammer in its own right. And What's interesting for us is the idea of the categorization of the objects that we collect while we are on a walk. And then the interest is in what discussion conversation is raised uh, in, by the very notion of that categorization. And Chris Drury's work here, um, he often creates these wheels. Um, and they are often wheels of long duration of walking and collecting artefacts. He calls them wheels, and some of them are webs as well. In here, a natural object for every day of the year. Twelve segments of paper, one for each month um, in the years 1983. So this is an invitation for all of you to take part. Collect your artefacts and um, curate them into what I'm broadly calling, uh, and in its widest sense, um, the Wunderkarma. This curious walk that you are about to take and the curious collection and assemblage that you are going to um, make. Um, we meet on um, Sunday to, um, again, to have a look and um, see what um, happens. So I and in that meeting, I really want the time to be spent for those who are taking part to really talk about the, the Wunderkarma that they create. The Wunderkarma as a material manifestation of your walk and where that material manifestation then takes us on the conceptual walk with you, where the material culture becomes the metaphor of the walk. There's also the conversation between the objects that you collect and the 
them together in their relationships and their interrelationships, some kind of holistic conversation, material conversation that becomes almost the cartography, a material cartography of your walk, of our walk. And so that is an invitation for individual walking, active walking, or whatever way you choose and would like to do that. I'll stop there because um, we've got some wonderful people here and it would be lovely to hear your thoughts and questions and, and conversations. And if anyone does have any questions, please obviously feel free to ask. And thank you much, Faye, to take us on this uh, drift uh, of thoughts yes. and, <laughs> and um, images uh, and uh, to do this together. Uh, now. Um, if anybody wants to um, continue this path uh, by bringing in uh, these ideas or questions, um, you're very welcome to do so. We are at the very peak of the effort here. Everything is moving smoothly. It's really you know, a great, it's great that we have the opportunity to see you even from a distance. And uh, the, you know, it was a, a big challenge for us, this uh, uh, encounters on every level. And, uh, you know, it has the same energy as uh, the previous time, we think. And it has been enriched from that opportunity that we have with technology to, to talk. But, of course, I have to say that uh, the remote projects or the projects with avatars, uh, because of them, energy of the space they are not so popular now the people want, want to just go out not to use technology not uh, <laughs> so, yeah, they don't even read the emails uh, the regular emails that we send them anyway but uh, we have many yes when we will finish all this uh, work uh, this uh, week we will uh, see how we interpreted uh, this idea of watching first of all the question of the conference but it is good that we are, we will be having the opportunity to compare it with what we did last year, uh, two years ago. We still have this strong, uh, uh, this very th uh, thorough documentation of all the projects, and uh, hopefully we. And so it it will be an ongoing library of workshops in this area, and to them there will be added, of course, the ones that we we are doing online. And the Baba book, of course, although I, just, Baba, I saluted those who have been to Prespa first. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> now, um, one of the essential things about walking is, and I'm very much inspired by Lucius Burkhardt uh, in his ideas about uh, Spatsirgan Vishishu, or the signs of walking, as he called it, where he makes a bridge between let's say the whole code, the subjective to the, the, the mind and uh, the objective of science uh, by uh, posing that uh, walking is something that is creating the landscape, that, that we create a landscape in our minds, we create uh, what is around us in our mind, at the same time it's not something that isolates you um, in your own existence, but uh, can only be experienced if you do it together. Uh, by sharing it as a form, alternative form of communication, as an alternative form of, um, um, there's a, of, of part uh, of, of sharing uh, your thoughts and ideas uh, that again transform and create what is around you um, in a positive way. And uh, that is something we sh um, cherish a lot here in Prespa, not only on the local level, but the people that here, with the community that is here, but in a sort of global wave and global uh, resonance with people that, um, uh, like uh, we try to do here, uh, believe that walking is much more than just a movement of space, there's a movement in and between uh, people. Uh, and it is a uh, great pleasure to have um, your approaches here that are so much uh, um, vibrating with what we do. So uh, we are not alone in Prespa. Gert, can I say something? Um, uh, whenever I hear certain names like Lucier and Cage, I have to, <laughs> I have to say something. Uh, are, you, are, are you familiar with Mary Lucier's? Uh, work with walking scores. 
Hmm? And, uh, yes, I do. Yes. Yeah, because uh, I mean, you know, Alvin gets mentioned a lot, but um, Mary not so much in terms of her work with walking and listening. So if anybody else listening to this hasn't seen Mary Lucia's uh, photographic scores, they're, they're well worth checking out. She 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 was the one who talked about this walking into a landscape, and and um, that was you know that was her her practice. Yeah. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jess, for, for sharing this. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I presume most people here know who Mary Lucia is. She was married to Alvin Lucia, but she, she's an artist, video maker, and um, the the infamous "I Am Sitting in a Room" was originally a piece by Mary and Alvin Lucia, with Mary providing the visuals. Sometimes, and uh, not only sometimes. Uh, it's essential. The essential of a conversation is the listening, and it uh, yeah. does uh, to listen to you all and to your um, to your thoughts, ideas, and visions about uh, being together on distance, which is not a distance, but which is only an illusion that we are separate, uh, and to see her walking can contribute to that. Um, if um, there are no further things or ideas or um, uh, feedback to share. Um, I have a question. Um, I have a question yes, to. Yeah. I have a question for Chess. So when when they in this um, all this course normally um, you just hand this out or have you do you also collect in a way responses to this course? That's just like an offering, but you you don't know what people are doing with it, or or do you do you gather any kind of responses to this course, or in which occasion people would do this course? Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've been working with photographic scores for a few decades now, and usually, if I'm presenting or or creating a project for a place, then yeah, then there's a a kind of archive, you know, people people can send in their realizations in whatever form. Some people respond with sound, you know, a sound recording, or some people respond in text. With this one, um, not so much because I was I was quite interested in the fact that obviously this this is a conference, and normally we would be all doing these scores together or in some you know in some combination. And I was quite interested in playing around with that a little and and not expecting people to send something back. I'm always I'm always, and I'm sure all the all of the artists who contributed will all be interested to know, you know, what people do with the scores. But I didn't want didn't want to sort of place it there as a kind of instruction that that that, that we must have something back from them. You know, but certainly, yeah, if, if people are welcome to uh, contact us through the website and and send back any realizations they do of them, and I'll pass them on to the composers if they don't know them. Mm -hmm. I build microphones for for sound industry, and it's just reminded me that there's a games company in Sweden who are working on a a game about sound walking. Oh, it's not a game; it's like an adventure where people can go on virtual sound walks in a in a game setting. So that's that's the next frontier. <laughs> but like you said, I think most people just want to get outside, <laughs> put down screens, and just get outside. Um, great. Um, I see that there's a question in the chat uh, from Rebecca. Uh, if uh, Christa, Christopher and Deirdre want to say something about unanimated gesture, so please go on. Thanks for the question. I, I suppose what we were thinking there when we were beginning to think about the gestures that we find around us is that gestures aren't just made by people walking, running, moving through space or, or even by the kind of the animals that, that surround us too dogs cats seagulls and um, certainly around here but um often we're surrounded by other things that, that interrupt our consciousness and that that do i suppose inflect the way that we we, we move and the way that we respond to space um, in portobello it's a, an area which is undergoing a lot of change a lot of construction there are lots of building site sounds, pile drivers, people, um, machines working. 
Um, there are also often flags flying in this in this beachside resort um, to tell you about water conditions and safe swimming. Um, so these are the sorts of things that we had in mind when we were thinking about inanimate objects and the gestures that are made by other things that we think are as important as the, the, the human gestures. We, we didn't want to create a hierarchy of, of gestures. We wanted to, to be inclusive and, and to think about our, our environment as a, as a whole. Um, and so that's why we wanted to include the gestures made by things as well as people and animals. Yes, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it, it, I think we, we discuss often uh, in this, this structure and in this project in the, the, the ways that we're applying it about this, this gap, you know, this space for interpretation. And I think we use gesture as, as a term for, for what's being observed and what's being performed in a very intentional way because it, it is this, this, this in-between thing, like what does constitute a gesture? Does it even have to be emotion? You know, you know, could you, could you sort of like creating a, a stoic, you can imagine a building, you know, standing stoically, you know, it's not moving, it's not any way animated, it's a, it's a building, but yet it still has a personality, it, it, it creates a gesture in the environment that's recognizable, we might be anthropomorphizing it, but that's, you know, we're humans, we do that, you know, uh, so this, this idea of gesture and being intentional with the articulation of human, you know, animal, or, or even, you know, non-animate, uh, objects or beings uh, really opens up that space for someone to engage with intentionality within their environment and uh, also it opens up that space where gaps can be found uh, and uh, as, as I said Deirdre and I we were, we're really interested in these spaces where gaps actually create creative opportunities and uh, a, a creative engagement. Thank you also for this conversation and this sharing and um, to invite you um, to our next uh, conversations and talks, which will be from Thursday on. Um, we will have a conversation with uh, Andrew, um, Andrew Stuck, who is here or was here um, just a moment ago. And with, uh, uh, on a Thursday evening, um, exploring the, the, the musicality and the sonority uh, of walking in all its aspects um, uh, relating to Prespa, to nature and uh, urban environments. Um, and on um, uh, Friday, Babak uh, will host a conversation about uh, deep mapping um, and uh, digital ways to connect um, with our environments. Um, so you're very welcome uh, to join us uh, on Thursday and Friday at the same time. Um, Thank you again for this uh, warm and uh, uh, deepening um, sharing of your practices. And I hope to talk and work with you in Trespass. <laughs>